Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown. I will be your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on this show, the best way to understand a community is to talk to people who actually live and work in those communities. That's why we are so honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome the mayor of the city of Regina, Mayor Sandra Masters. Mayor Masters, Sandra, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Christopher. It's nice to be here. <laughs> so, Sandra, let's start with the same question I've asked the majority of the people in Saskatchewan who've come on the show. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? <laughs> Honestly, it probably goes <laughs> probably goes back to grade two to Mrs. Courtney's classroom at the White School in Killarney, Manitoba. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that answer. Best answer I've gotten. There you go. Um, you know, if you go back to origin stories, uh, because I've had to reflect on this quite a bit. Some days more than others, you reflect more than others. Um, it was it was actually about for whatever reason as a as a kid like a young child in class I would get done my homework first or whatever class assignment we have and so in order not to be um, disruptive or to start chatting with my friends and distract them I uh, I would I would offer to help right because it was one of those things and and um, you know parents who keep their kids busy or adults who keep kids busy, we, we know that it actually helps both their own development as well as uh, um, um, creating that sense of community and connection. And so I used to finish my work and I would have 15 minutes and I would just get to help her. And so it granted me freedom because I would get to leave the classroom and go wash something or I would get to run something to the office and I kind of enjoyed it. So I got to help the teacher run errands which was um, kind of fulfilling in a way and uh, and um, got to keep busy. And so strangely, um, kind of helping out or volunteering to do things um, satisfied something in me and actually they always say that volunteering is, you know, that act of giving back, but people who volunteer know that it, that it fulfills something within you. So it kind of feels selfish in a way too, because you get so much out of it. And so I figured that out quite young as it turns out um, and just proceeded to sort of do that throughout school. And then um, I had kids, I had four children uh, in my twenties and, um, and then participated. One way to stay involved with them was to volunteer. And so always figuring out and then when you volunteer and you kind of see behind the scenes of almost anything you realize how much effort and work goes in to providing service to providing um events to providing uh experiences for people so volunteered and it was volunteering that actually ultimately ended up kind of being the trigger point for my putting my name forward to uh, volunteer for public service <laughs> in its official format from a from a government perspective <laughs> So I want to know from you, what was the draw municipally? At the end of the day, you could have chosen many different ways to give back through that uh, public service, whether it be provincial, federal, municipal, school board. But at the end of the day, you chose in your first election outing, mayor of the city of Regina. What was it about that municipal draw and that municipal uh, sort of service that you said this would best suit who I am and how I can give back to the community. Uh, two things, I think. <laughs> the first, the first thing being this is um, this is where I live and this is where I raise my kids, and I only have one out of four still here. Everybody wanted adventure to go elsewhere, but uh, based upon where a couple of them ended up in their schooling, they now live somewhere else because they've made their homes there. And not having my kids think that Regina is uh, a wonderful place to settle and raise family is uh, troublesome to me. And hey, I graduated in the 80s and uh, I know the volume of young people at the time that left this province for other places. You can just tell at CFL games across the country when the green show up, uh, the green shows up. <laughs> so 
um, there's that concern about being a city that people can see themselves in or young people can see themselves in. That's a concern of mine. I, I sort of live it in my household. Um, and the other one was, again, kind of focused around my kids. Um, I did raise my kids in the city of Regina and it afforded me an experience as a single mom. Uh, I was able to put them in activities and uh, the community, um, and it didn't matter if it was art or if it was sports or, or something more cultural, it was the uh, the volunteering of other parents, but that community of, of, of parents and coaches that helped me get four kids in four different directions often. Um, but how important the city having amenities and having services and park space and whatnot enrich the life of my kids and so I think about what, you know, how kids develop and, 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 and what makes something feel like home and feel like an experience that's, uh, that's, um, it, that's deeply satisfying, both as a parent and as a child. And the city of Regina had it and, uh, and had it in a way that it was small enough that I could pull that off and, and kind of on the cusp of being big enough where you got big city things as well. And so kind of through that, those experiences, um, the importance of park space, the importance of amenities and, and recreational facilities for kids to enjoy and experience their friends, the importance of jobs and the economy for them. Again, you, you can see that we have a university here and then what can you do after that university for how they settle here? So um, really focusing in around what families can choose to access. And then again, going back to my young adults going, what's there to do? <laughs> and so understanding how important art and culture uh, and events to participate in places a community gathering are for that sense of connection and community. That's how I ended up on the, on the board of the Regina Exhibition Association Limited and understood that um, we're investing in some things, but we're not actually being really thoughtful and planning about what makes a city uh, a place where people want to, come where they want to live um, and and how they can kind of experience things necessary to 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 go throughout the world and be on par wherever they show up right that's that's sort of what drives it so what happened in 2020 what was the catalyst to say sandra's going to get involved in this election this is the election that uh, I'm putting my name forward. Was there community people reaching out to you and saying, Sandra, we need you to put your name forward? Was it something in the back of your head saying, maybe this is my shot. Maybe this is the election that I need to put my name in the hat. What was the catalyst for you to finally pull that trigger and say, enough's enough. It's time to either put up or shut up. <laughs> I was actually one of the people in the community trying to find somebody to run, actually. <laughs> Love that. Hey, that's a little bit of a thing. Um, you know, there was a group of us that were trying to determine was there someone else that was going to present themselves um, again to kind of kickstart a city that was it, it was it, pretty stagnant, uh, and and um, and so having conversations around is there anybody like willing to put their name forward and banding names about we were in fact asking people, and then it sort of got turned about on me and said, well, why don't you do it? And I kind of went, okay, whoa. Um, <laughs> um, like I didn't, I said, you know, I, I, I think that you could find someone out there who was either, um, ran provincially or federally, at least ran before in a campaign that you could put someone's name for it. And they said, you know, no, that's not how this works. Like anybody can do this, like, just 18 years of age and six months living in the city. And I'm like, okay. And so we kind of bandied it about, I had a meeting with, uh, you know, just a couple people. We sort of went through it and said, all right. I'll sit here and think about this, but go talk to your kids, talk to my kids. And um, and then uh, two weeks after I had a conversation or even the week before I had a conversation with two of my four kids, uh, we went on lockdown with a pandemic. And I talked to the other two during the pandemic in that first week or two of lockdown. And uh, and my kids are very funny as adults. So, you know, that's well, of course you should probably do that. Why wouldn't you do that? Uh, good for you. And the other, one of the last ones was, uh, uh, okay, well, thank goodness we have different last names or, you know, that might present some problems for me. <laughs> like, okay, whatever works. Um, and then actually, as, as we kind of came out into the summer, sort of it was about June and we were looking at it, uh, 
because we kind of went into, everyone went into crisis mode. The world went into crisis mode, right? And so sort of 12 weeks later, someone sort of said, we should probably talk about this because the election is still going to be held there. You know, if you're going to do this, you're going to need to make some decisions relatively quickly. And I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> um, they said, do you still want to do this? And I said, well, we have a billion dollar infrastructure deficit. We have stagnation. We have an, we're in a bit of an economic downturn due to oil and gas and, you know, um, the transition into uh, greener energy. Um, we, <laughs> when we're in the middle of a global pandemic, I mean, why wouldn't I want to do this? There's nowhere to go, but up it would seem. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the situation you found yourself in to finally say, yeah. yes, there's, there's only all these issues that are facing yeah. our city. Why not yeah. put my name forward? I mean, really, if not now, when? Like, it's sort of thing. But interestingly, though, I had a conversation a few weeks after that one. So now we're into the summer of 2020. And I met with some folks who had real political experience, like political campaign experience. And my, me and my, my close friends did, did not. Uh, I had some really good advisors. But there's also a provincial election that fall. And so everybody with a whole bunch of, you know, campaign experience was kind of tied up. So, um, but they were great in terms of just meeting or, or being available for phone calls as we're like, just what work do I need to do? It's okay, go do this. Um, but I had this conversation with a, an individual who had political campaign experience, had run multiple campaigns. He said, you know, I don't know, Sandra, you seem like a really nice person, but you should probably run for council. And I went, I kind of made a face sort of, I didn't say anything. I just sort of stared at him for a minute. And then it was, but, you know, I said I would rather probably poke myself in the face with a stick than do that. Uh, and they said, you know, why is that? And I said, I because I see an opportunity. I say I see a I see all of those things I kind of described the month previous. But I think there's ready for a change. I said, if uh, the former mayor is reelected for a third term, then it's a, it's a wide open field. I don't think people are expecting it at this particular one. I think some of the usuals are going to run uh, that have run in previous elections. Um, we're not hearing any other names because, frankly, we've been looking for other names. We're not hearing a whole bunch of other names out there that are interested in in, in taking it on. And I actually I think there's an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to kind of flip it a little bit on its head. Um, and then I was told, well, you need to understand that. You have no name recognition. There is voter apathy. There's going to be voter fatigue because, of course, then the American election was also between the provincial and the municipal election. And everybody was watching that one, given what was going on in the United States. They said people are tuned out. Um, you can't gather. You can't go to large events to introduce yourself like, like you're a long shot. And I said, OK. And then post this meeting, um, who with the gentleman who had arranged it said, like, are you okay? Like, I'm really sorry that meeting didn't go well. I said, that was a fantastic meeting because it actually laid it out in terms of, hey, if you're going to do something, you're going to have to be really smart and strategic about how <laughs> during a pandemic, which nobody has any experience, nobody alive has experienced yeah. campaigning during, um, what are you going to do to 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 get out and, and, and reach folks? So yeah, it was, I said, no, it was a great meeting because it actually set the stage and you know, at this particular point in time, I, my concern was I've, now that I'd spent a few months having getting my head wrapped around it, if I didn't do it, I would probably have to move because I'd be so frustrated. <laughs> I, you know, I want to I want to pick on I want to pick up on something that you just said, and it's kind of a crux of what I was talking about at SUMA with a lot of uh, counselors and mayors from across Saskatchewan apathy. And there is a massive apathetic nature when it comes to municipal government, municipal politics in, uh, I would say Canada, but I would even say outside of Canada as well. Y you're right. People were not tuned in and not engaged in the municipal election in uh, 2020. And even in Alberta and BC and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, we're seeing numbers go down. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, as now as the mayor of uh, the one, the capital of Saskatchewan, believe that there's an apathetic nature when it comes to municipal governance and municipal politics? I just, I, I, I think even though you're an order of government and you're definitely closest to the people, I, I think there's this, um, I think there's a sense in some respects that it's, um, oh, those people are volunteering. Okay, we'll pay them. Um, can go handle it and don't understand 
necessarily um, the weight of the decisions that you make at the municipal level. Um, but it just seems like when you're setting tax policy, income tax policy, provincial sales tax, GST, those are those are big items that really carry the bulk of the weight. When it's about laws and legislations and regulations, people think about everything from you know gun control to healthcare to education. Well, those are all outside the jurisdiction of a city. So the really big things that affect people's lives that they have a passion for or an interest in at a minimum, I would think, um, those don't happen necessarily at the city level. And, and the kind of, again, the sort of paradox is, is that, gosh, don't pick up someone's garbage and see what happens to them, right? Like to their, to their world. But we're the devil in the, we're the devil of the details. We're the, the potholes that you drive on every day. We're the, we're the trees or the lack thereof every day. We're the water that gets you. We're the sewer. We're your basement backing up. We're, there's so many things about the people, I think, in some respects, take a little bit for granted is maybe the wrong word, but but oh, that it just exists. It's just part of the landscape. And so um, and I will actually suggest that um, from a communications and a, a branding perspective, I don't know that cities do a super good job communicating to their own residents the, the importance of of kind of what they do. It's. We um, we sort of stay low and kind of out of the and being out of the airwaves is almost more important because again when there's the potholes come in the weeds come in the snow comes in people are aggravated because it affects their time which is the most valuable thing we all have and it affects how they get to experience their day um, and so that's where you become important and so you're usually dealing with things that oftentimes in some respects are out of your control um, or require planning over time or just take time to repair to complete um and people can get we i just don't think we i don't think cities generally do a good enough job saying um you know communicating uh or branding the importance of of the services that they deliver do you think you do because I, i'm not, not, not trying to put you on the spot here mayor masters and i, I do apologize if i ask this question inappropriately but um most people will not, and I'm not trying to br- uh, paint a broad stroke here. Most people don't know what a gov- uh, municipal government does. They they will come to you with federal issues. They will come to you with provincial issues. But they're coming to you for a reason, because you're the elected official that they've put into that position to go vote on certain issues or uh, help grow the city in a way. While there's an apathetic nature, while they may be more upset about snow clearing or weeds and all that, they don't care at the end of the day if it's a federal provincial issue. They want you to fix it. Do they not? No, it's surprising that, you know, really, I, I actually like we hear it oftentimes we don't care about jurisdiction. Like we'll hear that. Well, I'll, we'll have advocates on a specific issue that we don't have jurisdiction over pick health care. We don't have jurisdiction over health care. And they will add, they will come at us and that like, no, we're, it's really not us. We have literally no legal, no legal rights to this issue at all. Um, and so I did think that because I've heard that. I've heard that from some other mayors. Um, but man, when you test it, you hear from the majority of people that say that is not your business. Your job is roads, garbage, snow. Like, it's interesting to me that if you just follow certain media points and aren't in touch with the people, um, the people are pretty clear on what's yours and what's not. It doesn't mean they don't want to talk to you about it. Like if we're, if we need to participate to find land for a school or to provide land for a school, yeah, then they understand that's our role. But I would tell you the majority, at least 50 plus 1% weigh in when you overstep your jurisdiction. Like it's, it's fascinating because I thought it would go the other way. No, no, they actually care now. You're the Do first mayor want... to challenge me on this. You were the very first yeah. politician to challenge me because everyone else seems to be the complete opposite. They would say 50 plus one is in the complete opposite angle. There is, I, I, if I were to go out and talk to 10 people, and I go into public, I'll go to the grocery store, and I talk to 10 people about a school today, they know it's not my job. All of them know it's not my job. Um, Good for Regina. Doesn't mean, yeah, they, they, it doesn't mean that they don't Hey, if you're talking to the province or, <laughs> Hey, if you're going to Ottawa, can you like, we can't, they will, they will, they will, like, there's a understanding, I think of advocacy by and large, like they understand that, Hey, if you're talking to the 
province about something, we really need X. But I'm not getting yelled at by teachers because they want more funding for for classrooms. Like that's 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 not a thing. Um, I'm not I'm not getting uh, called to task for. Um, but are you for, getting called to task uh, for like doctor shortages, hospital closures? Like you're the mayor of a city, and if a hospital closes, that affects your residents, oh, does it huge. not? That, that would be massive. But no, nope. they know it's not us. Wow. That's good for Regina. Yeah. I, I am impressed. Yeah. Right <laughs> oh, well, and, and, and again, because it's been tested on some issues, um, the influx has been, well, we think this is important and where you can play. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use houselessness as an example, like loud and clear people understood. This is not your job. This is, yes, we appreciate the work you're doing, advance it, advocate for it. But this is not this is not in your jurisdiction. This is not your wheelhouse. Do what you can, but holy cow, you're not. There's taxes being collected to pay for this elsewhere. Um, yeah, it was. I will tell you, it was at least fifty plus one, if not more. Good on them. I, I want to uh, switch uh, switch gears here a little bit, and I want to start with this question in my next segment. How do you, as mayor of your city, balance the needs of the individuals? against the needs of the growth of the city. Because every individual person I go talk to in Regina, I guarantee you they'll have different issues, different concerns that they believe needs to be addressed from a city level. But you as mayor have to take those, and as council as a whole, have to take those individual needs and have to address them with not infinite amount of money, not infinite amount of time, but you have to address them. But also remember that sometimes you have to not look at the individual needs, but look at the city needs. How do you do that? It's painful. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, An I get honest asked answer kids. again. I love it. Yeah. You know, I get asked by young kids all the time if I do brownies or do schools. It's like, what's the hardest thing about being mayor? I said, you literally cannot make everyone happy. You can't actually do all the things that either you want to do or the key or ideas from the community. And I said, it's really difficult because you know, those choices and they need to be made. That's, that's your job. You've been elected to make those choices. Um, and in terms of the balancing, what I have found is on an individual basis, oftentimes it rolls up into something bigger. So if someone has an idea about a performing arts center, for example, that rolls up into something along the lines of where can we put folks to do the different cultural elements? Cause you know, we, we, we have a number of rinks and we're really booked in our rinks and we've invested there, but as a city, we haven't really invested in performing arts. And so who can we reach out to? Who can we contact to advocate or to feel out kind of um, the solutions? Because oftentimes, you know, if someone's advocating for something on a, on a very specific basis, they're not just advocating with me, they're advocating with other groups. And so um, sometimes you, it's it's about having the conversations on, is there a place for us to play? Um, like, can we offer up, you know, a gymnasium? Can we offer up space? Can we um, look at something that's serving the cultural needs and look at potentially, you know, what, maybe a property tax exemption might work there and help facilitate something, however small, because oftentimes those things are they're kind of nuanced and they don't fit in any bucket. Um, or it's it's advocating. It's like, hey, we know that there's needs to be a, a blood, a, like a bloodly blank. Um, and we know you've got this space and could it be, you know, and there's usually, everybody wants their buildings full. Everybody wants, you know, people around and, and people want to, to do things, right? And so it's, it's really that. Um, I always think it's important because, Sometimes I'll chase something down because <laughs> on an individual basis, like the MeritRegina.ca gets quite a number of emails and feedback from everything from road construction to garbage collection to to cultural events and, you know, everything in between um, where I'll chase it down a little bit and it always seems to roll up into something bigger. Um, and so it's a really about <laughs> the great connector about when you're having a thousand conversations in a month 
who's connected and who should talk to each other because there's probably a synergy there that they can you can push forward um, or who do I know is working on something that I think you should talk to these people or I actually think these guys have a program that might be good for you and so um, and then it's how much, the how much of your job is being a referee then sort of ho- helping helping people join together and connect and being that link that so, sort of needs to happen in municipal in the municipal realm yeah. because you're right there's always those groups that just don't want to talk to each other. Well, they may not even know they need to talk to each other. And you as mayor probably have to say, Hey, X over here and Y over here would make a great team to work on this project. Yeah. It's about what, at least once a day, there's at least one meeting or call I have a day where it's like, wait, I know someone who's doing this. And, and, but that is about getting out and actually having the conversations and learning about what different organizations are doing as well. Um, and then it's always coming back to the big issues. Like at the end of it, if we don't have jobs, we don't have population growth. If we don't have population growth, we can't pay to have nice things and to actually support uh, more community-based services. Uh, and so it always has to roll back up to time is finite, money is finite. And um, like how expensive is this to play in? And, and sometimes it's that. How many years does this take to accomplish? Whereas you got... We have really amazing people in our city who like are crazily passionate about it um, and want good things to happen. It's like anytime you meet one of those, I'm just going to park this because I'm going to connect you with somebody at some particular point in time. So it's it's a, it's a little bit of that. It's trying to figure out who's doing what and where there's some sort of connection to pass that off to and see what they can grow. Um, and then from a funding perspective, you know, I'm pretty aware of the infrastructure deficit we have um, and how important that is to support business growth, to support people living here and to support having nice things and nice events, nice venues and um, nice other other organizations that are helping to kind of build that vibrancy in your community. So really always keeping that top of mind and moving those pieces around that way and helping out when you can on a very individual basis. In your opinion, and this is a conversation between myself and you, and this is not a motion of council, direction of council, or a policy of council, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Regina? Or what is the biggest, what are the biggest issues facing the city of Regina as of recording this today, in your opinion? Is it that infrastructure deficit or is there something else that we haven't talked about? No, I think it's it's actually uh economic it's actually job growth. It, uh, parallel to infrastructure investment, those two things on uh, more the structural economic side, on the kind of social cultural side, it's, um, it's, it's uh, continuing to advocate and I call it play around the ages, but connect the dots and bring folks together on the houselessness issue, as well as then ensuring that we have, um, which is both frankly an infrastructure issue as well as a programming issue, um, but ensuring that we have um, investments being made that again, are attractive to people. We need to attract people here for jobs. We need jobs to pay taxes. We need taxes to afford all the other things. And so it's this infinite loop. So how do you see yourself as mayor and council of trying to address these issues? Because that does not seem like just a city issue to be dealing with. It seems to be a federal, a provincial issue, even a a local issue like Ward 1, 2, 3 through 9 have to deal with this issue. How do you see your role in trying to address this issue and bringing everyone that needs to be at the table to the table to address this issue? I think it goes back to having those meetings and those conversations, building relationships, both provincially and federally, so that you can get in a room and then you can have a conversation Um, and and uh, being out in the community to understand both the challenges of organizations, uh, businesses, social groups, community based organizations um, and learning about where they tie into other programs. And where our plans are kind of fitting in there, it's the Tetris game of uh, (laughs) politics, but it's, you cannot do one thing and solve this. Like you can't do one thing and advance the city. Like it's not the way it works at all. So relationships uh, are enormously important. Gaining an understanding of who's doing what, how they're doing it and um, kind of the availability or opportunity for um, either connecting them together or connecting them to other forms of, of funding. 
Um, and then I can tell you, we have an incredibly generous and philanthropic community. Like our business community supports local charities like, like to a phenomenal level. And the same principle applies, connecting them to, you know what, there's a real need for kids in here, in this school, for this program. And can can we get some help? That, that connecting piece is important. Um, sometimes everybody at the table at the same time just gets you nowhere. You'll get introductions and three hours later, you're done, right? Like, and so uh, a lot of this is spent with uh, uh, myself or particular um, counselors or administration folks going out and having the meeting. And so everybody is out doing those things, gathering information, building relationships, and then connecting the dots where you can. And having that vision of these, this is what's important. This is what's actually gonna move us ahead. Um, and then some things I specifically will will carry, if that makes sense. Like there are certain things that I think are either so fragile or so fractured that I'll carry them to a certain point uh, through, you know, a, a small committee or um, um, just that individual work where we continue to sort of build something until we can make it bigger, make it go you know, that type of idea. It, it, understandable. I have one last question on this segment before we turn to my last one. It's my favorite segment, tourism, but I want to talk about for a second advice. You have been mayor of the city of Regina for almost two and a half years. You're in your second half of your first term right now. There's a lot of people in New Brunswick, PEI, Ontario, Manitoba, BC, who have just recently got elected. And they're trying to navigate their first 100 days, 200 days, 300 days in office, trying to figure out how to be a good mayor, councillor, Reeve. What advice would you give a new councillor, new mayor, new Reeve that you wish you would have had when you first got elected in uh, 2020? Um, I, there's a reason you ran. Don't let anyone beat it out of you. That's probably the wrong words to use, but don't let anyone try to suffocate your reason for running. Don't, and don't lose sight of that bigger picture because like if, to your point, if you're going to get stuck in the individual um, and not understand how everything has to roll up into something bigger, um, don't lose sight of that. And there's days where it's, it's, you just want to go home and sit in your room and have really quiet wall space around you. <laughs> Don't talk to anyone. Um, I always say that, you know, at the end of every day, regardless of what happened, um, what was said, what was done, what's happening. Um, did I have the best information I could possibly have in front of me? Did I try to make the decision that's for the best interest of my city? Because if I've done that, those two things, then I've done as good as a job as anybody could do in that situation. Um, it's, it's not about me. It's not about another person. It's not about, it's, it's really about best for the city. Which sometimes doesn't mean it's best for every individual or they don't get what they want, but what's best for the city and, and how does it fit in to tomorrow? Cause there's always going to be a tomorrow. And so we have a real problem, I think with short-sightedness, this political cycle of four years, it's hard to spend so much of your time working on something that is going to be sincerely enjoyed and appreciated a term or two past you, but that's actually your job. We got, we get caught up, but that's your job is to what's good 10 years from now. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to turn to tourism for a second. And I love tourism. I love exploring. I love going to communities. But I like finding the hidden gems. I like finding the little gems that most people wouldn't know about. And I like asking mayors and counselors, what are the hidden gems in your community? So, Sandra, what are the hidden gems of Regina that people who listen to the show from across Canada and around the world would need to see if they ever come to Regina? Hey, uh, the RCMP uh, depot is not so much as a hidden gem, but during the summertime, they hold sunset ceremonies. And if you've, uh, if you're in town and there's a sunset ceremony, you want to go. It is spectacular. It is um, kind of goosebump inspiring. They're young cadets. 
and um, it's it's a it's a pretty cool experience to understand how they how they build team, how they build discipline and um, stature and pride. It's it's a it's a pretty cool thing for uh, love of country. Um, we have uh, we have folks who either visit or who are originally from Regina but now live worldwide, and they will tell you that we have some of the best restaurants in the world. They will come here for pizza. Pizza is an interesting thing that uh, we ship. We have restaurants that ship our pizza, Regina pizza, around the world. Um, and every ethnicity that you could possibly want, we have a incredible multicultural community and our restaurants. If you're a foodie, uh, you could spend weeks going to different restaurants here, experiencing unbelievable food. Um, we've got historical buildings and, uh, and incredible artists, the longest running symphony in the country. Our legislator, legislative building is second only to the parliament. We have one of the most beautiful parliamentary buildings in the, uh, in the country. And, and beautiful um, grounds. May I, may I interject there as well? When I was there covering uh, Saskatchewan politics for a few days, I can tell you it was the most awe-inspiring legislative grounds I've ever been to, and I've been to almost all of them in this country. <laughs> it it is on one of the, on one of North America's largest urban parks is where our legislative building sits, and so um, Wascana. It's again, it's this parkway that's that's uh, in the center of our city that is enormous and beautiful and. Um, um, there's restaurants in it, there's uh, walking paths, there's, you can take a boat tour of the creeks and learn all about for laurel and fauna if you like. And we have one of the oldest turtles, I think, in the uh, province of the country, Olga. <laughs> just random, just random things I know. Uh, yeah, we've got, uh, and then I, I, I love to tell people the story. I had friends that uh, had uh, honeymooned in Italy. And they're in the, you know, they're in the wine country and they're in a villa and, and they come back and he's like, we just couldn't believe these sunsets. Like, would you look at this? And they're showing me these photographs and I'm like, Meh. <laughs> like, you know, we got northern lights. We've got sunsets and sunrises for days. That's called the land of the living skies for a reason. Um, and so it can be quite peaceful. And then, yeah, we've got we've got unbelievable indoor skate parks and golf uh sorry um basketball courts and volleyball courts and pickleball courts so yeah you want to play recreationally something here it's uh it's a, it's a pretty great city to hang around in so, so i'm gonna end on the million dollar question and this question you can take as long as you want to answer or as short as time as you want to answer in your opinion mayor masters what makes the city of regina such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family I, honestly, it's the people, and I know you probably get that from a lot of mayors, but bar none, people who are always shocked. I like to tease people. Oh, they're coming. They've never been here before. Just wait. They're going to say what an awesome time they have and how unbelievable, the polite and kind, helpful and fun the people are here. Um, we love, maybe it's because of our winters, uh, but we love seeing other people. We love welcoming other people, making them feel like really um, at home. Um, we pick random people up and give them lifts when they're here for concerts. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll help out with uh, changing tires. And, you know, on top of that, there really is an enormous amount of opportunity to live a full life when you only have to drive 15 to 20 minutes to get from one end of a city to another and can access all of the amenities can get your kids into programs and into, you know, recreation facilities, into park space, um, and actually be able to afford a home here. It's, uh, you know, the average selling price of a home, uh, you know, the average house price is $315,000. And in most other major cities, it's unheard of. So you can have a really great life but it is the people. And I can, and I know that's the truth because people who move here go, I live here because I can actually afford the holiday and I can afford a cabin, but it's the people that keep you here because we're, um, we're pretty great. Well, I'm looking forward to visiting Regina later this summer, but also next year for the 2024 SUMA convention. I want to, I want to thank you, Mayor Masters, for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, it's always great to learn about, why people get involved in municipal governments. And I can tell you that you seem to be doing it for the right reasons. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So, Thanks for having me. 
So with that, I want to remind everyone to put down your social media phone and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be better. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day, everyone.